Hey guys, it's Senti Reads, and as you can see by the video title, today I'll be reviewing Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. Garmu? Sorry, I didn't look that up before this. I think I've mentioned it before, but I'm actually a chemist for my day job, so I'm coming at this review from that perspective of someone with a chemistry degree who actively works in the field today. There were things I liked about this book, but mostly things I didn't like, so be warned this video is going to get ranty as per usual, for this channel. This is also your warning that there will be spoilers for both the novel and the TV show, so click away now if you want to read this story or watch it for yourself. One final warning before we jump into this discussion, the story can get dark and has many distressing elements, so please look at the screen now for a content advisory. I know there's some pretty dark stuff on this list, I promise I don't get too graphic, but for the sake of your own mental health, if any of these things in any capacity are going to bother you, please click away now, I totally understand. With that mountain of disclaimers out of the way, let's jump right into my thoughts on lessons in chemistry. Here, I, I've got an experiment for you, safety glasses on. Before I give a plot synopsis, I want you to take a look at this cover and tell me what you think this book is about. There's this kind of sassy looking blonde lady with some fierce makeup with her red lipstick and she's got a pencil in her hair and she's looking at some cartoony generic science equipment. In combination with the title, Lessons in Chemistry, this comes off to me like a romantic comedy with a vaguely sciencey backdrop. Like something like the love hypothesis is what vibes this is very much giving me with this cover. Like a light beach read, and I don't mean that in like a derogatory way, but like a, a fluffy kind of read is what I get from this cover. Now what if I showed you this cover? Pretty different, right? The romance vibe is completely gone in my opinion, and we're getting our first real hint that this is historical fiction with the retro TV and the style of dress on this creepily headless woman's figure. My expectations for the story when I look at this cover are completely different from my expectations when I look at that first cover I showed you. I already knew what this book was about when I picked it up, but I've heard criticism around how this book was marketed specifically because of that first cover I showed you before. Lessons in Chemistry is very much not a whimsical romantic comedy beach read. Like, it is not that at all. It's actually very dark and kind of disturbing at times. Well, not disturbing, but it is it is not like a, a light read. It can have some very distressing elements in here. So I can see how people would not enjoy this book if they picked it up under the pretense of that first cover thinking that they're getting like this light whimsical romantic comedy and while there is a romantic plot line in this book I wouldn't really classify it as a romance at all so I personally don't like the first cover. I think it completely misrepresents the novel's story and vibe, and I wouldn't like the book either if I'd gone in blind based on that first cover. I mean, regardless of the cover, I still personally didn't like the book, but at least I didn't feel misled when I picked it up. Okay, now we're finally ready for the plot synopsis. Lessons in Chemistry takes place in the 1950s and 60s and follows Elizabeth Zott as she struggles to gain footing in her career as a chemist due to the rampant misogyny of that time period and the expectation that women should be homemakers. Despite being staunchly against marriage, marriage and children, Elizabeth unexpectedly falls in love with a fellow chemist named Calvin and she finds out she's pregnant with his child after his unexpected and untimely death. Being an unwed mother in the 50s was apparently synonymous with being the devil, so Elizabeth loses her job at the research institute that she was working at, and through a series of conveniences and coincidences, she becomes a fairly popular daytime television host. Elizabeth was originally hired to host a generic cooking show called Supper at Six, but she manages to insert a bunch of chemistry knowledge and strong feminist messaging into the program, which earns her as many haters as supporters. Right as the show is really starting to take off, Elizabeth leaves to go back to her true passion as a chemist. Before I get into some more specific topics, I want to say off the bat that I really wanted to like this book. I actually picked this book up with the expectation that I would like and enjoy it. I swear I'm not a hater and that I only read books I hate. Like, I really, truly wanted to like this. As a chemist who also loves cooking, I thought this would be right up my alley, but there's a lot about this story and its presentation that I don't like. I won't go too in-depth on this point, but the writing style was really not my favorite. It has sort of a third-person omniscient POV that explicitly feels like a narrator talking to an audience, which is something I personally don't enjoy. It's fine if you like that, I just don't. The book is also very choppy and jumps around a lot with a lot of scene breaks and short segments that don't always flow together very well to progress the story, so it's just kind of all over the place. With that out of the way, there are three main topics I want to discuss for the rest of this video. The first being the novel's portrayal of science, the next is religion, and the third is misogyny slash feminism. I, I had to lump them kind of together because they kind of cover the same stuff. Oh, and there's a fourth secret bonus topic that you'll have to stick around until the end of the video to see. Let's start with the main reason I picked up this book, the science. Yes, science! Outside of science fiction, I don't really see a lot of representation for scientists as main characters, so I was excited to see if I could relate to our protagonist, Elizabeth Zott. Science, specifically chemistry, is often misrepresented in media, at least in my opinion, so I wanted to see how accurate it was here. 
As I've mentioned a couple of times before, there were things I liked and disliked about this book, so let's jump into some specific examples. For context, Elizabeth works at a research institute, and she's super passionate about abiogenesis, that's like her research topic that she's chosen, and abiogenesis is the theory that organic life originated from inorganic substances. I know that seems more like biology than chemistry, but science in general is just very multidisciplinary, so I'll give that a pass, even though that to me doesn't immediately come off as a chemistry topic, like whatever, I get it. I will say that I believe it's uncommon to conduct research for the sake of fundamental scientific knowledge outside of an academic setting. Um, she is not working at a university, it is explicitly a private corporation. Typically, if you are a research chemist for a company, that means you are developing new products or technologies for the sake of being able to sell that to a customer. Meaning you don't work on anything that isn't profitable, so you're not, you're not researching for the sake of expanding science as a field, you are researching science behind a product or technology that you can sell for a profit. I won't say what industry I'm in, but that's pretty much what my job entails, although I mostly support existing product lines to keep our quality high instead of creating new products, but th anyway, that isn't to say that a research institute like the one Elizabeth works at doesn't exist, but I would say it's a less common type of job for a chemist outside of academia, which whatever, it was already kind of a strike against the book for me because that's not relatable to my specific type of chemistry, but I, I can't really hold that against this book. Anyway, let's get into some of my actual gripes with this book. One of the main things I dislike about the portrayal of scientists in this book specifically is, and kind of in general, but specifically this book, is that they all kind of act like Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory. I was wondering if you could maybe teach me a little physics. A little physics? <laughs> There's no such thing. Physics encompasses the entire universe, from quantum particles to supernovas, from spinning electrons to spinning galaxies. Boring! Shut up, nerd! You know, sort of awkward, blunt, they're always talking in jargon that nobody understands, and they're somehow super genius level intelligent, but they retain no self-awareness. So they're just, I hate that character type so much. At dinner, the conversation lurched between the molecular breakdown of aromatic acids, Calvin, to what movie might be playing, Deirdre, to the synthesis of non-reactive proteins, Calvin, to whether or not he liked to dance, Deirdre, to look at the time, it was already 8.30pm and he had to row in the morning so he would be taking her straight home, Calvin. It goes without saying that there was very little sex after these dates. Actually, there was none. Ha ha ha! Isn't it so funny that this wacky genius scientist gets no puss because the only thing he can talk about is his research? What? No, it's not funny, and it's not realistic either. Nobody does this, at least nobody I've met. Um, if you've been on a date with an obnoxious science person who just won't shut the fuck up, like, please tell me about it, but I personally have never experienced this. 20 minutes later, she was helping him into his house. I think we can rule out the aerosol dispersion of diphenylaminarcine, she said, since no one else was affected. Chemical warfare, he gasped, holding his stomach. I hope so. It was probably just something you ate, she said. Food poisoning. Uh, in English, please? <laughs> <laughs> At least in this case, it's two scientists talking to each other, so whatever, but that doesn't change the fact that nobody talks like this. Like, what the fuck? The over -y dialogue continues with Elizabeth's cooking and is one of the focal points of her TV show, Supper at Six. Now I'm disrupting the egg's internal bonds in order to elongate the amino acid chain, she told him as she whisked, which will allow the freed atoms to bond with other similarly freed atoms. Then I'll reconstitute the mix into a loose hole, laying it on a surface of iron-carbon alloy, where I'll subject it to precision heat, continually agitating the mix until it reaches a stage of near coagulation. Just say you're scrambling some eggs in a frying pan, damn it! Also, don't use the word coagulation when you're talking about food, because that word is kind of fucking nasty. Sorry, I'm being feisty today, guys. There's some- I don't know. I just am bothered right now. <laughs> Pass the sodium chloride. Oh, for the love of God, if anyone ever asks you for sodium chloride instead of salt, like table salt, you have my permission to give them a wedgie for being a huge fucking nerd. It's about the shopping list, some confusion about tomorrow's ingredients, specifically CH3COOH, acetic acid, Elizabeth supplied, vinegar. It's 4% acetic acid. I'm sorry, I probably should have written the list in layman's terms. 40 grams thorium nitrate. Yo, Mr. White, I can't even pronounce half this shit. No, you know what? Count me out. Yes, you should have written the list in layman's terms. One of the most important things about being a scientist is being able to explain your work to others, especially to people who aren't experts in your field. Your research is useless if you can't effectively communicate it to anyone. This involves making sure you understand the audience you are talking to and not using terms that they will not understand. 
Also, even amongst chemists, we rarely write out the chemical formula like that, like CH3COOH. If I was writing a list, I would never write that because that's so complicated. I would just write acetic acid. They're cinnamaldehyde, she explained. Oh, I just can't wait to be Joe S. For fuck's sake, just say you made cinnamon cookies. Nobody says cinnamaldehyde when they mean cinnamon. All right, so here's the cinnamon. Cooking is not an exact science, Elizabeth had said just yesterday. The tomato I hold in my hand is different from the one you hold in yours. That's why you must involve yourself with your ingredients. Experiment. Taste. Touch. Smell. Look. Listen. T test. Assess. Then she led her viewers through an elaborate description of chemical breakdowns, which, when induced by combining disparate ingredients in heat-specific ways, would result in a complicated mix of enzymatic interactions that would lead to something good to eat. There was a lot of talk about acids and bases and hydrogen ions, some of which, after weeks of hearing it, Harriet was oddly beginning to understand. I know I've been complaining a lot and kind of on the verge of losing my mind, so I wanted to show something that I did kind of like about this book. Cooking really is a representation of chemistry, whether you realize it or not, so there are some helpful things to consider when whipping up dinner. Like with the example here, with the tomato, if you have a more acidic tomato than you usually get, then you need to add some more sugar, or if the tomato is super watery, then you may need to boil your sauce more. So, like, there are useful lessons to be learned when we don't have the unnecessary jargon barrier of, it's cinnamaldehyde cookies, ooh, like... Stop. Safety glasses off, motherfuckers. Outside of the ridiculous dialogue, there were a few things related to safety that made me raise my eyebrows. Not to sound dramatic, but my job can be genuinely dangerous, and a bad day at work for me could result in my death and the deaths of many others, whether that be through an explosion, a fire, a release of toxic gas, like the list goes on. Chemistry can be some serious shit, and you really do need to take your job seriously while you are working in a lab environment. As she stood outside Calvin Evans' lab, she noted a number of large warning signs. Do not enter. Experiment in progress. No admittance. Keep out. Then she opened the door. Oh, no, 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 no. I think the fuck not. This, when I, as soon as I read this, I actually almost closed the book because I could not even respect Elizabeth as a scientist after she just did that. Like, that pisses me off so much, you can't even believe it. So at my job, we put up red tape around particularly hazardous areas. And if you intentionally cross the red tape without permission, even if it looks like there's nothing going on in that area at that time, that is grounds for being fired on the spot. You do not disregard the red tape. You do not disregard caution warnings. Now, I know the sign on the lab here, it said, do not enter, experiment in progress, no admittance, keep out. It doesn't explicitly say, like, hazards, be aware of whatever. But that is still something that you should just respect, and I would respect. And, and I don't think any good scientist is going to just barge into a potentially dangerous situation to ask for some beakers. Yes, that's what was so important that Elizabeth completely ignored that sign and just barged in. She heard that Calvin's lab had a surplus of beakers, and she went to take some because her lab has a shortage, because nobody will approve her purchase orders because she's just the lowly woman chemist in the department. I'll cover the whole misogyny bit later in its own section, but putting that aside, this plot point is really silly to me. <coughs> That's all to say that beakers are not some, like, really specific equipment that you absolutely must have to work. Elizabeth is shown to be really resourceful, so I think she'd just bring in some old jars from home or something else to use as a makeshift beaker. Like, you just need a glass container to hold some liquid. It, it doesn't need to be a beaker. It could be anything. Calvin, surprised to hear a voice, poked his head out from behind a large centrifuge. Excuse me, miss, he called, irritated, a large pair of goggles shielding his eyes from whatever was bubbling off to his right. But this area is off limits. Didn't you see the signs? She watched as Elizabeth popped Matt up onto her lap, then held her close to the bubbling test tubes. The child's eyes filled with wonder. What had Elizabeth called her teaching method? Experiential learning? Okay, this might be one of my biggest pet peeves. What is up with people believing that everything in the lab is some kind of like bubbling potion? I think this comes from commercials when they show a lab, there's always these bright colored foaming liquids bubbling like a cauldron because it looks better on camera, but that couldn't be farther from reality. Everything I make in the lab is either brown, clear, yellow, or kind of orangish. There's not these crazy bright colors. Those really bright colors are really only found in inorganic chemistry or if you're doing some kind of titration with a color indicator. Also, almost nothing is bubbling in the lab ever, especially casually out in the open in like a open test tube. Like, no, 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 no. Never. If something in my lab is bubbling, it's because it's generating toxic gas. So you best believe I wouldn't let a child anywhere near some bubbling test tubes. 
The biggest benefit in being the child of a scientist? Low safety bar. As soon as Mad could walk, Elizabeth encouraged her to touch, taste, toss, bounce, burn, rip, spill, shake, mix, splatter, sniff, and lick nearly everything she encountered. You licked a dead spider. I think we need to get you some air and perhaps have a long talk about unresolved childhood issues. I think the fuck not. This could not be farther from the truth. As I said before, a bad day in the lab for me means I kill myself and several other people. Science is not just some wacky fun time where you throw a bunch of shit together and see what happens. Like, no. No. Also, there is no situation where it is appropriate to taste or lick anything in a chemistry lab. And if you're going to be sniffing things, you need to be really careful about what you're sniffing and how you're doing it. You need to be wafting the smell towards you instead of just sticking your nose in and huffing because you could die or just pickle your brain or knock yourself out. Like you, you got to be careful with sniffing and licking and tasting are absolute no-goes in a lab. A pencil instead of a pen? Because unlike ink, graphite is erasable. People make mistakes, Mr. Roth. A pencil allows one to clear the mistake and move on. Scientists expect mistakes, and because of it, we embrace failure. Then she eyed his pen disapprovingly. Wait, what? If scientists expect mistakes and embrace failure, then doesn't that mean they should prefer writing in pen over pencil? Because if you're embracing a mistake, you're not erasing it? When I'm writing in my lab notebook, I always use pen because erasing past failures is a damn good way to repeat them again in the future. Embracing failure means keeping a record of what didn't work so you don't spend your time doing work that's already been done. Also, don't mind me, I'm gonna get back on my soapbox here for a minute. If you are a chemistry student or work in a lab or anything similar to that, for the love of God, please keep a lab pen. And I, I don't mean there's like a special pen called a lab pen, just a regular pen that you only use in the lab because you don't want to contaminate your pen with something gross and then give yourself a chemical burn in math class later that day when you're starting to take notes. Sorry guys, that's enough soapboxing for now. The last thing I want to talk about in this section is Elizabeth's home lab. Once she's fired from Hastings because she's pregnant, she tears the kitchen out of her house to replace it with a lab while still pregnant so she can continue her research on her own terms at home. The shelves, which span the length of the kitchen, were freshly lined with a wide array of laboratory materials. Chemicals, flasks, beakers, pipettes, siphon bottles, empty mayonnaise jars, a set of nail files, a stack of litmus paper, a box of medicine droppers, assorted glass rods, the hose from the backyard, and some unused tubing she'd found in the trash bin in the alley behind the local phlebotomy lab. Ugh. Brother, ugh. Just above the new double sinks were two carefully hand-lettered signs. Waste only, read one. H2O source, read the other. Last but not least was the fume hood. You mean to tell me the woman who MacGyvered a whole lab together from, like, coat hangers and tubing from the phlebotomy lab couldn't find something else to use as a beaker? Like, it says she has mayonnaise jars. Why didn't she use the mayonnaise jars as beakers at Hastings? Like, hello? Also, why does she have a waste sink? Did she redo her whole plumbing system so that the sink does not connect to the main water supply? I know it was the 50s, but nowadays you'll get your ass handed to you by the EPA if you just dump all your waste down the sink instead of properly disposing of it. There are many reasons I don't agree with home labs, including that your neighbors are probably going to think you're making meth. Someone cooked here. Meth jokes aside, my main gripe with home labs is that you should never, ever work in a lab alone. All sorts of things can go wrong in a chemistry lab, so it's good to have a buddy around in case shit goes sideways. If you set yourself on fire or blind yourself with some chemicals, you're better off if someone is there to drag you into the safety shower to save your ass. There are other reasons that I don't like home labs, uh, another reason being the whole waste disposal situation, like how are you going to properly get rid of these chemicals that you're using? They cannot go in the water supply, at least most of them can't. But that's really all I have to say about home labs for now. And there's more I can dig into regarding the portrayal of science in this book, but those were my main thoughts, and I don't want this video to be, like, forever long. So now we can move on to what this novel seems to think is the polar opposite of science, which is religion. Before I begin this section, I want to make it known that I'm an atheist. I wasn't really raised in a super religious environment, so I just really never thought about God all that much. Even if I wasn't a scientist today, I think I'd still be an atheist because the two are not mutually exclusive. I know plenty of chemists and other scientists in general who believe in God. I personally don't, but I'm cool with everybody's beliefs until they infringe on my freedom. Like 
I'm sorry, we're getting off track here. I got back on my soapbox. I swear we won't just stand on it for the whole video. So let's get into the analysis, shall we? For context, there is a religious character named Wakely who attends one of Calvin's chemistry lectures and the two form an unlikely friendship despite their differences in beliefs. Back when he'd been at Harvard Divinity School, Wakely audited a chemistry course. His goal? To learn how the enemy camp explained creation so he could refute it. But after a year of chemistry, he found himself in deep water. Thanks to his newly acquired understanding of atoms, matter, elements, and molecules, he now struggled to believe God had created anything. Not heaven. Not earth. Not even pizza. Wakely later goes on to become a priest, so he must have gotten over this existential dilemma, but there's something about this that really rubs me the wrong way. Uh, like, first of all, in a chemistry class, you're not taught about the creation of the earth. At least I wasn't. So that's kind of out of the scope of a chemistry class, in my opinion. And I don't like this idea that religious people are only interested in science as a way to try and disprove it. As I said before, I know plenty of scientists who also believe in God, so I really don't think it needs to be one or the other. Science is not the opposite of religion. They exist together. While I don't personally believe in God, I think it's easy to rationalize that if God created the entire world, that means he also created science, so we should embrace that and learn as much as we can about his creation. You can believe in science and God at the same time, and even if you don't believe in science, you aren't immune to the laws of science or the laws of nature. Gravity doesn't care if you believe in it or not. You're still gonna fall on your ass if you jump. I don't believe in science. I just like, it's like I don't understand it, so it's easier not to believe in it. She paused, straightening her belt. Walter, don't you find it interesting that people even use the term act of God, considering that most want to believe that God is about lambs and love and babies in mangers, and yet the same so-called benevolent being smites innocent people left and right, indicating an anger management problem, maybe even manic depression. In a psychiatric ward, such a patient would be subjected to electroshock therapy, which I don't favor. Electroshock therapy is still largely unproven, but isn't it interesting that acts of God and electroshock therapy share so much in common in terms of being violent, cruel? Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, so this is a prime example of why I really don't like Elizabeth's character. I can't remember the context leading up to this conversation that I just shared with you, but it wasn't about religion, so she kind of threw this little rant in for no reason other than to be kind of a jerk. If this novel took place in modern day, I'm sure Elizabeth would be a reddit mod for r slash atheism. As for her point, I do kind of agree with her honestly, but comparing God to electroshocks in the psych ward is just kind of yikes and really uncalled for. There are a few other little jabs against religion sprinkled throughout the book, and I think that's really alienating and unnecessary. I absolutely think it's valid to criticize religion, but that's not why I picked up this book about science or a book I thought was supposed to be science. And as I said, it's very alienating and science is for everybody, it, or at least it should be. So I would not want to alienate religious people from learning more about science by degrading their beliefs in this way. I just don't think that's appropriate. Anyway, there's probably more I could say in regards to religion, but as I said before, I don't really have a strong religious background, so that's not really my ground to cover here. I'll, I'll leave that to other people who have more education regarding that. I am, however, a woman, so unfortunately I have a lot of experience with this next section that I have titled misogyny. I'm tired of this, Grandpa! That's too damn bad! I wasn't alive in the 50s, so this is all just my subjective opinion, but I felt like this book went way too hard with the misogyny to the point that it becomes comedic at times, and I wasn't fully sure if it was on purpose, because I don't think the narrative often goes far enough with the comedy to be considered parody. So it just makes for a really odd and disjointed reading experience because you're getting all this whiplash, especially because there is a fairly graphic rape scene early on in the book that I will not go into detail about here. And there is another attempted assault towards the end of the novel as well. And again, I'm not going to speak too in depth on those scenes because honestly, I just don't want to. And the seriousness of those situations is at odds with the comedic way the misogyny is portrayed at other times in the book. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about them, but just know they do exist in this book and they are very jarring compared to some other things that are presented. Before I jump in with some examples, I want to talk a little bit about my own experience as a woman working as a chemist today. I don't want to minimize what anyone else has experienced, but personally, I don't feel as if I've encountered a lot of misogyny in the workplace, not in the workplace, not in life in general, uh, I'm sorry to say, and especially anything overt as what Elizabeth went through in this book at her workplace. Um, so I, that's not to say that those things are not still happening today. 
That is all to say that I have not personally experienced that. That's enough about me. Let's get into some examples from the book. Well, lunch, Walter Pine managed as he took in the woman who stood resplendent before him, her white lab coat casting an aura of holy light, save for one detail, the initials EZ emblazoned in red just above the pocket. Walter could only stare, tall and angular, with hair the color of burnt buttered toast pulled back and secured with a pencil. She stood, hands on hips, her lips unapologetically red, her skin luminous, her nose straight. She looked down at him like a battlefield medic, assessing whether or not he was worth saving. So I thought about putting this in the science section, but I thought it belonged better here. Elizabeth is repeatedly described as being captivatingly attractive throughout the book, which just sort of feels weird and unnecessary in a way I can't exactly pin down. It also feeds into the trope or stereotype that all male scientists are like wacky old men, like evil geniuses, and all female scientists look like runway models. Also, her name is Elizabeth Zott, but putting the initials EZ, as in easy, was clearly an intentional insult. Who? Donati had asked when the cub reporter first brought up Zot's employment record. Zot? Oh, wait, you mean Luscious Lizzie? Luscious is what we all called her, he said, which she used to protest in that way women do when they aren't actually protesting. He smiled, proving his point by producing her old lab coat, which still sported her initials easy. Luscious was a great lab tech. That's a position we have for people who want to be in science but don't have the brains. So the context here is that after Elizabeth's cooking show got popular, reporters interviewed her old co-workers at the research institution she was fired from for being pregnant, and Donati was her boss. They never actually call her Luscious Lizzie on the page, so I don't know if Donati was just fully making that up to embarrass Elizabeth, which he probably was, but this is an example of the book taking things way too far. Putting EZ on the lab coat is insulting enough, like the message is clearly portrayed to me, and it's the exact kind of minor yet insidious misogynistic act that men pull as a power move because there's plausible deniability that it wasn't meant as offensive. So I think going on to talk about this whole luscious Lizzie, like that's, it, it was already bad enough. You didn't have to take it to this next level. Here's the thing though, said Walter, trying a different tactic. I know you don't want to look fat. I beg your pardon? On camera. And please don't take this the wrong way. You're a heifer. And she said, well, it don't look like you need the extra McRib. Excuse me, bitch! Yikes on bikes! A heifer! So, for context, this is a TV producer who's trying to get Elizabeth to wear the impractical and somewhat skimpy, at least for the time, outfit that the wardrobe department picked out for her to wear on the show. And even after being called fat, she still doesn't budge. So, good for her in that regard. But Elizabeth's unwillingness to follow orders for the show is a reoccurring and unrealistic problem that I'm not really going to go into too much in depth in this video. Um, I've heard other people in other reviews say this really bothered them, and it bothered me too, but that's not the point right now. I don't, I don't know that anybody would just be like, you're a heifer. Next, apply a liberal amount of sodium chloride. Would it kill her to say salt, Walter hissed? Would it? I like how she says sciencey words, Rosa said. It makes me feel, I don't know, capable? Capable, he said. Capable. What happened to wanting to feel slim and beautiful? And what the hell is going on with those trousers? Where did those come from? As readers, we're supposed to think this guy is a gross pig for talking about weight all the time. But simultaneously, in this book, there is an evil male character that is fat, and his fatness is pointed out every time he's mentioned. Like he's literally called bulbous and blubbery, and he's so fat that he's always sweaty. And I say I called him specifically evil because he is a rapist, so I'm not trying to defend him. But I don't think it's fair for the narrative to make commentary on how women are weight shamed while unironically shaming a fat male character just because he happens to be evil. Like, you don't get a pass to body shame someone just because you don't like them and then say that body shaming is wrong. Also, was it really that big of a deal for women to wear pants in the 50s? Like, why is he so hung up on the fact she's wearing pants? Like, what? She wrote in and wants to know if she's sinning by wearing pants. Absolutely not. Not me. Certainly not I. Miss Frask, now age 33, who for the last four years had dutifully followed every path promising promotion, from overselling Hastings benefits to spying on specific departments to authoring an in-house gossip column called You Heard It Year First, had still not been promoted. In fact, she was now reporting to a new hire, a 21-year-old boy fresh out of college with no discernible skills other than making chains out of paper clips. As for Eddie, the geologist she slept with to prove she was marriage material, he dumped her two years ago for a virgin. Today's latest slap in the face, her new boy boss had given her a seven-point plan for improvement. Item one, lose 20 pounds. 
can we stop with the weight shit already? Like, I get it. Also, I understand that back in the 50s, it was likely very difficult for women to get promotions, even when they are clearly the best choice. But being this overt with it doesn't make me sympathize with the message. It just kind of makes me roll my eyes. And that's why I don't know if this is supposed to be parody, because I don't know if this is supposed to be funny, because I didn't laugh. <laughs> Girls, she read aloud, make your very own perfume. Using science. Good God, Walter. And the box is pink? Get these people on the phone right now. I want to tell them where they can stick their plastic file. So after Elizabeth's cooking show got popular, there were advertisers jumping on the trend to make products for aspiring young lady chemists. And so she was presented with this product here. I'm pretty conflicted on this because it can be infantilizing or pandering or however you want to phrase that to design products for little girls to be overly pink and feminine. But at the same time, there are a lot of little girls out there who like pink. It's not inherently wrong to like cute pink stuff especially as a little girl, or anybody. Everybody likes cute stuff. So I don't really know where I stand on this issue here. I go back and forth on this. With science education, you have to meet people where they're at. So I think it's a decent introduction to chemistry to make your own perfume, because that's a product people commonly use. There are cosmetic chemists out there whose entire jobs are formulating new fragrances. So it's legitimate science as well. I think there's a discussion to be had about marketing beauty products to children, especially with the stuff going on in the media right now with kids ruining their skin with unnecessary skincare, like the drunk elephant or whatever the fuck that thing is about. But that point is completely glossed over here. It comes off like Elizabeth doesn't like the kit solely because it's pink and girly, and so that makes it less valid to her. I just want to say that's not inherently the case. Things are not less valid just because they're pink. Is it a problem if every product marketed for girls is pink? Yeah, I kind of think so. But as I said, like, I don't really know specifically how to feel about this, but this rubbed me the wrong way. Elizabeth Zott held grudges too, except her grudges were mainly reserved for a patriarchal society founded on the idea that women were less, less capable, less intelligent, less inventive. A society that believed men went to work and did important things, discovered planets, developed products, created laws, and women stayed at home and raised children. She didn't want children. She knew this about herself. But she also knew that plenty of other women did want children and a career. And what was wrong with that? Nothing. It was exactly what men got. Mic drop. Pack it up here, folks. I have no notes on this. It is so fucking true. There is good stuff in this book. It's just, there's so much stuff I don't like. But this, ugh, it hurts. The problem, Calvin, she asserted, is that half the population is being wasted. It's not just that I can't get the supplies I need to complete my work. It's that women can't get the education they need to do what they're meant to do. And even if they do attend college, it will never be a place like Cambridge, which means they won't be offered the same opportunities nor afforded the same respect. They'll start at the bottom and stay there. Don't even get me started on pay, and all because they didn't attend a school that wouldn't admit them in the first place. Elizabeth has some good points here, but they don't really make sense given some other context. She has a master's from UCLA, which is a pretty well-respected university today. I don't know if it just wasn't in the 50s, but this kind of makes the whole Cambridge argument fall flat because she did go to a prestigious university. I also don't like the implication that staying home and raising children means that your potential is being wasted, not only because I think women should be free to make their own choices without judgment, but also because I resent the idea that we have to sell our labor to support our capitalist society in order to have value as people. Freedom. Yeah, no offense, but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. Sorry, I'm soapboxing again, and also... Don't get this twisted. I don't really support the whole trad wife thing that's happening. I think trad wife is different from stay at home mom, but I think people should make that choice and you're not less valuable because you don't have a job, like a, like a formal job. The last thing I want to talk about in this section is how over the top Elizabeth's TV show is with the message of empowering women. Obviously, I agree with the empowerment of women, but they go so heavy handed with it in the depiction of Elizabeth's show that it made me roll my eyes and I've done that so much it's a miracle they haven't popped out of my head yet. There's a segment where Elizabeth asks the audience what they aspired to be before they became housewives, and a woman stands up and says she would have been a heart surgeon. The reaction from the rest of the room had me laughing out loud. The room filled with a thick silence, the weight of her ridiculous dream hanging like two wet laundry on a windless day. Open heart surgery? For a moment it seemed as if the entire world was waiting for the laughter that should follow. But then, from one end of the audience came a single unexpected clap, immediately followed by another, and then another, and then ten more, and then twenty more. And soon everyone in the audience was on their feet and someone called out, Dr. Phyllis, heart surgeon! And the clapping became thunderous. <laughs> I 
after everyone was finished clapping, did they all give her a hundred dollars too? Like this feels like it came straight out of an r slash that happened post and, but just wait, it gets even sillier. Before I go, she shouted, I thought you'd be interested to hear. She held up her hands to quiet the audience. Does anybody remember a Mrs. George Phyllis, the woman who had the audacity to tell us she wanted to become a heart surgeon? She reached into her apron pocket and pulled out a letter. I have an update. It seems that Mrs. Phyllis has not only completed her pre-med studies in record time, but also has been accepted to medical school. Congratulations, Mrs. George. No, I'm sorry. Marjorie Phyllis. We never doubted you for a second. Elizabeth dropped all of this while she was giving an impromptu exit speech after abruptly quitting her job on the show to go back to being a chemist. I think it's a good moment to show that women can experience internalized misogyny themselves with how Elizabeth at first calls her Mrs. George Phyllis and then corrects herself to say Marjorie. Like, she's guilty of also doing certain things like this. Also, she says we had no doubt, but just earlier in her little speech, she said she had the audacity to be a heart surgeon, which kind of seems doubtful to me. As I mentioned before with Elizabeth talking about Cambridge and her previous point that women are held back by society because they can't get into higher education, this is kind of like breaking that image. It's really convenient that Marjorie was able to get into a university quick enough to complete her pre-med studies in record time and then get into medical school just as quickly so Elizabeth could have this feel-good story to share in her last episode. This to me kind of implies that the only thing holding Marjorie back was herself, not men or society, which might actually be true, but it's at odds with everything else this book has presented with women in the workforce. Elizabeth always believed in herself and she always wanted to be a chemist. She was always very clear about that, but that just wasn't enough. She was still constantly shit on despite her passion. But somehow Marjorie was instantly able to overcome societal pressure because she was empowered to do so. Like, what? It just doesn't really work that way, and I don't like the message that you can girl boss your way out of adversity because it clearly didn't work for Elizabeth. She's been trying this whole time and, like, can't get her footing. So why all of a sudden is it happening for Marjorie? Like, how is Elizabeth facing all these struggles and then Marjorie was just like, yep, I want to be a doctor. I'm in med school now. Even though the book, like, said, oh, women have this hard time getting into education and Marjorie just did it? Like, what? what what, what are you trying to say? To me, it feels like the book is simultaneously saying that women are just as capable as men and can accomplish great things if they just work hard. But then it also crushes that dream by saying society is inherently too patriarchal for women to succeed and they're all stuck being housewives and they're all victims of their circumstances. And it's like, can you girl boss or can you not? It seems like it's trying to have it both ways. I feel like the reading experience of this book sort of gave me whiplash because I couldn't tell if I was meant to feel empowered or depressed or some weird combination of both because of the mixed messaging. I can't end this video on that depressing note, so it's time for the secret fourth bonus topic I hinted at in the beginning of the video. My biggest complaint about this book, and I have had many complaints, but this is something that frustrates and baffles me the most, is the magic dog. What the fuck are you talking about, man? So I think I've mentioned it before, but they do have a dog and he's not literally magic, but he might as well be, which feels really strange in this novel that is like so scientific and everybody's using all this scientific language. And then there's just this magic dog. The dog is obnoxiously named 630 because Elizabeth found him at 630 in the evening, which is stupid. And like they make so many jokes about like getting confused about the dog's name and it's supposed to be funny and it's like not funny. Elizabeth found 630 because he was wandering the streets as a stray because he failed out of bomb sniffing dog school because he like couldn't smell the bombs or he was too anxious to smell them or something but like okay except that whole point makes no sense because later on in the book after Elizabeth's cooking show has gotten super popular 630 the dog thwarts an attempted bombing at the studio after an episode where Elizabeth announced she was an atheist no shit that really happens he's watching the show on tv like at home when he recognizes that there is a person in the audience who isn't clapping and somehow in his dog brain he's like oh that's not a fan that's a hater like i gotta get over there so he runs like 10 whole miles across town to the tv studio and plays dead so security will take him inside to get him some water or like some medical help and then he runs out into the audience and covertly grabs like the bag that that person had next to them and leaves it with security who then discovers the bomb and takes credit for thwarting that whole attempt and it's like, what the fuck? How did 630 fail out of bomb school if, like, he's this good? Like, he can find a bomb from 10 miles away by watching the TV? Like, I'm s what? Anyway, the reason why 630 is so smart is never really explained, but it's stated that it's partially due to how well Elizabeth trained him. She used some kind of super advanced methods to basically teach the dog how to understand English, like not just like understand commands, like he understands English as a language. According to Google, the average dog can learn about 165 words and the top 20% of intelligent dogs can learn 250 words. Do you want to guess how many words 630 knows?
like a thousand. At one point, they say he knows 981 words, and that wasn't even at the end of the book. There are some pretty wacky things in this novel, but it's all kind of grounded in reality, so this hyper-intelligent dog really feels out of place, and the science is just an excuse to claim that he isn't actually magic. But he's so intelligent that it is magic. Like, he understands the concept of death. Like, he is too advanced. There's, like, he's magic! 630 reminds me a lot of Bond from the anime Spy Family. They're both big scruffy dogs with failed military backgrounds who are so intelligent it borders on supernatural, except I think Bond is kind of explicitly supernatural, but whatever. They also have precocious little kid sidekicks, but Anya is a lot more realistic of a portrayal of a child than Madeline Zott. I think they're about the same age, like four or five. I haven't really talked about Madeline in this video, but she is just as intelligent as the dog. It like to a magic level, like this fourth grader should not be this smart. She's basically young Sheldon on steroids. From the creators of Young Sheldon comes even younger Sheldon. Yuck. In conclusion, I really wanted to like Lessons in Chemistry because it seemed like something that would be right up my alley, but it just wasn't and I just didn't like it. The poor marketing doesn't convey just how bleak this novel is, and it wasn't the kind of wacky Vsauce meets Julia Child rom-com that I was hoping for. The portrayal of science is okay-ish, but I hate how it's put in opposition with religion. The over-the-top misogyny comes off as comedic, which is confusing given the other darker things that happen in this book. I think this book had a great message that attempted to empower women, but it just falls so flat for me. I had intended to watch the miniseries before making this video, but I really don't care to sit through this story again. And I've seen some clips on TikTok and it just makes my skin crawl. Like the way everybody talks is just like so cringe to me that I don't think I can sit through it. I don't hate this book enough. Like despite all of my complaints, I don't hate this book enough to say like nobody ever read this book but just manage your expectations when you go into this. Anyway, that's all the time I have to rant about this disappointing read. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye, guys.